I need to wait 15 seconds. Okay. Okay, so um, welcome to everybody to today's uh, digital challenges lunch, the last one in this year. And um, our guest today is Naomi Fraser from uh, Newcastle, who will talk to us about uh, style in science fiction and fantasy and how to research it using the cell of the So, yeah, enjoy your yeah. lunch. Well, firstly, I have to say thank you to Professor Edda for having me here at this institution and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about my PhD research because this was uh, all of what I will talk about today has come out of my PhD thesis, which means that I've condensed it a lot for today's talk, so hopefully it will still make sense. Uh, but the problem that I addressed in my research was style. And it was style in these two genres, which is problematic whether or not you are computational stylistics or not. Style is not often discussed in relation to either of these genres, and they're more studied for their ideas. But there have been a few linguistic studies on these genres before, before I did my research. One was by Peter Stockwell, who said that Though science fiction is the most conceptually experimental of genres, breaking and rewriting the laws of physics, the style of its language has traditionally been very pedestrian, conservative, unimaginative, and unspectacular, almost the complete opposite of the ideas it explores. Some critics have since suggested that style is plain deliberately. It draws no attention to itself so that it can stabilise what is otherwise a very experimental genre. This plain style of writing has been exonerated by writers such as Ursula Le Guin, who studied, uh, and, and also studied closely by other linguists such as Susan Mandela, who has argued that studying plain language is still very informative because it reveals how language is used to remarkable effect in grammatically relevant ways. However, these studies by ling linguists haven't actually penetrated the critical discourse of either genre. And despite prominent authors claiming that style is a very important aspect of their craft, language is still not really discussed critically in either of these genres. Samuel Delaney, a very popular science fiction writer, said, we must get away from the distracting concepts of science fiction and examine precisely what sort of word beast sits before us. Stylometry, in my opinion, offers, offers us some tools to do just that. However, I've only employed one tool throughout my thesis, and that was principal component analysis, or PCA. This method examines the relationships between variables, the words, and observations, the text, and when applied to literary text, it returns new components that explain the variations in the data. The most variance is found in the first component, and in each sub subsequent component, less variance is explained. David Holmes has explained the value of PCA in literary studies. He says, quote, no mathematical assumptions are necessary. The data speaks for itself. Clustering of points, each representing a sample text, are clearly visible as outliers or points which do not conform to any pattern. And John Burroughs once said at a conference that was on the topic of computational stylistics beyond authorship, that PCA is still, quote, the best exploratory tool we have for literary studies. The, explor the explorations that today's talk will cover come under one very broad question, which is what can be learnt or gained by measuring style in science fiction and fantasy? The topic is broad. Style is a very unexplored area, as I've mentioned, in these genres. So to narrow the problem, my thesis focused on three case studies, each with a distinct research question, but each using the same methodologies. The purpose of this approach was to focus on the questions that John Burroughs theorised in his early work would be available to the computational researcher. That is, the questions that are of interest beyond authorship and are of a wider concern to literary scholars. I'll introduce each case study separately, but because this this was foremost a literary project. There are some questions of definition that I want to address first. 
for instance, the question, what is style? There's been a really excellent paper that came out recently by Herman Van Dallen Oskerman Schock. I have trouble pronouncing these names, but that defines style as, quote, a property of text constituted by an ensemble of formal features which can be observed quantitatively or qualitatively. However, the, the authors of this paper acknowledge that their Anglo-Saxon tradition did not, the Anglo-Saxon tradition did not feature much in their research. And since all of the text, focus texts in my thesis are by British authors, I have investigated some other approaches to literary definitions of style. In 1921, John Milton Murray pointed out three different and overlapping uses of the term style as they're invoked by literary critics. These are style as personal idiosyncrasy, style as the highest achievement of literature, and style as technique of exposition. Of these three, Murray suggests that only two are relevant to literature, the study of the individual and the study of the highest achievement that qualifies as literature. Significantly, Murray notes that literary critics have this tendency to have two definitions for any given term and then use them interchangeably without ever identifying for their audience what they're saying. This happens with the word style. This habit of confusing the two definitions occurs where idiosyncratic style is often a requirement for literary style. He says, a great writer is never more intensely and recognizably himself than in his greatest passages. For the purposes of literary studies, however, there's still this problem of definition today. Even though he said this in 1921, he said, when we say that Marlowe had style, we are referring to a quality which transcends all personal idiosyncrasy, yet needs or seems to need personal idiosyncrasy in order to be manifested. I raise this today because a lot of style stylometry is applied to distinguishing author's signals. And yet, I'm trying to do it in terms of genre, but it seems that even within the literary tradition, it's necessary to have this personal style in order to count as being truly literary. And this is, it's a, it's a problem for literary studies, even aside from stylometry, that we still conflate these, these definitions, because, and we can see this most clearly, I think, in the case of science fiction and fantasy. Firstly, styles with a highly idiosyncratic nature are very uncommon in these genres, at least to, uh, the, to, to the reader, the human reader. It's, it's difficult to uh, distinguish sometimes, particularly in some of the pulp um, writings, whose style belongs to whose. Secondly, these genres have not tended to adhere to the code of what constitutes style. Obviously, there are some uh, exemptions from this, and there are some very famous cases where particularly academics will try to, to hold up the few authors in their genres who can uh, claim to have an idiosyncratic style and a literary style that's experimental uh, in order to claim that, yes, see, fantasy science fiction is literary. It is. It can belong in the halls of academia. But language in science fiction and fantasy um, often disappears into the background, and mostly people, even when they try to celebrate it, don't really talk about it. They'll say it's good and then they won't explain why or how it functions or what it's actually doing. In a study on Philip K. Dick, who is a very celebrated science fiction writer, Carl Friedman celebrated Dick's serviceable style and in prose he called functionally adequate for the fast-paced narratives. But because it had this function, Friedman calls, said it lacked the elusive resonance of incontestably literary prose, whatever that actually means, and that it fails accordingly the most prestigious test of literary significance, style. In these comments, we can identify one of the predominant aesthetic values of the 20th century. Art that is functional is not art. So prevalent is this concept that we can find it even in Brandon Sanderson's fantasy work that was published only last month. One of the characters declares, Art is not art if it has a function, and goes on to demonstrate. Take this fork. It has a use, eating. Now, if it were to be ornamented by a master artisan, would that change its function? No, of course not. 
It has the same use, ornamented or not. The art is the part that serves no purpose. Therefore, when the language of science fiction and fantasy is regarded as being plain, pedestrian and functional, it is simultaneously disqualified as art. How can it possibly be art if it is plain, unadorned and utilitarian? Before I attempt a response to that question, there's an additional concept relating to style of these genres that I want to discuss. This is the notion that the style of these works ought to adhere to certain standards. One of the most important maxims for writers of the Anglo-Saxon tradition, and it might be similar in other traditions, I'm not sure, but it has been taught all across our universities in writing classes, show, don't tell. J.R.R. Tolkien has been accused of telling. Burton Raffle wrote an essay critiquing Tolkien's fantasy trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, arguing that it did not constitute literature. Again, the most significant measure used to determine what is literature was style. Raffle compares Tolkien's descriptions of chairs to an American author Thomas Wolfe's description of a chair. Tolkien's description goes, these are low and comfortable chairs. These were chairs placed in the prancing pony where the hobbits had just come in. Wolfe's description is, she replaced the disreputable furniture of the house by new, shiny, Grand Rapids chairs and tables. Raphael argues that by using the reference Grand Rapids, the reader is allowed to experience the chairs and tables for themselves. As the reference implies mass-produced and factory-made furniture, it also implies a meaning there. But Raffle asks, what is a low and comfortable chair? Raffle, a native to Wolf's America, is apparently blind to the limitations inherent in the cultural reference. For those of us dwelling outside America, and for those readers who begin for a time to dwell in Middle Earth, the question is, what is Grand Rapids? Certainly the cultural reference carries meaning in the context of Wolf's artistic aims, end of capitalism, the limitations of the mass-produced product. Grand Rapids can be said to serve a function. Therefore, is it art? The function of language in works of science fiction and fantasy should not be so readily dismissed for including adjectives in the place of external reference. So far, I've raised Murray's idea that style is something belonging to individual authors, and idiosyncratic style is usually required in order to meet the measures of literary standards. I've suggested that the genres of science fiction and fantasy do not always conform to this definition of style, and at various times in the 20th century, critics of these genres were said, have said that some of these texts even failed the test of literature on account of this one measure, style. Early in my PhD work, I became very excited by the idea of exploring these so-called pedestrian styles by using the very same pedestrian elements of language, the words that often go unnoticed. So in each case study, I've counted only the most 100 frequently used words, and I've done this consistently across all three case studies. The question for a literary scholar, however, is how can one relate the patterns in these words and the usage of these words to concepts of genre and other literary concerns, including style? So to unpack these stylometric findings, I regularly have invoked Thomas Pavel's concept of genre norms, which I'm just going to introduce briefly because it will come up. Pavel wrote the genre, that genre norms are collections of recipes or of artistic solutions to representational problems. This is unlike other concepts of genre theory that holds, for example, uh, Brian Atterbury's Fuzzy Sets, which is very popular in fantasy fiction theory, which borrows from the family resemblance theory and describes fantasy fiction as a fuzzy set of texts that are all related to just some core examples. So they don't have to be related. All the texts belonging to this set do not have to all be related to one another in some way, just to the core. In this way, genres have centers, set centers, but not necessarily any perimeters. They can always fluctuate and change and expand. So the idea that groups, set, like genres are grouped according to these shared uh, representational problems is not unusual in science fiction and fantasy, but to invoke Thomas Pavel's genre norms is to shift the current focus of genre theory, which current genre theory, particularly in science fiction and fantasy at the moment, has a preference for historical approaches where the origin point of a genre 
cannot be ascertained and where the prototype for comparison of the fuzzy set can change depending on the researcher's uh, perspective or uh, research question. Subsequently, this is a very academic approach to genres. And to say that genre norms are collections of recipes, artistic solutions to shared representational problems is more of a writerly approach. It asks how the authors solved their representational problems by turning to the artistic solutions other authors found for similar representational problems and adapting them, perhaps altering or discarding some aspects. But it also lends itself really well to discussing results from PCA. Uh, I'm going to outline my methodology really briefly and then go off script to get into some actual results, which is why you're all here for a digital humanities luncheon. So my methodology, I just kept the approach consistent across all three case studies, even though they all each deal with different corpora. So the approach was kept consistent. Um, I, select, I counted 100 most frequent words. I kept all of these words, function words and any other words that came into it, except I discarded any names and salutations. I only did this because some of my uh, one of my corpora in particular is quite small and names did come up, but then they weren't necessarily always in each example that I studied and I wanted to make sure that all of the words I used were uh, in all of the text represented. Uh, so that was the only thing I, I fit, but then I did not go and recount. So uh, whatever words and salutations I took out, I was left with that number of words. So in the end, it does vary slightly. There's 99 words in one corpus, 100 in another, 92 in the last one. The point was not uniformity, but just consistency of the procedure for me. And also the choice not to add extra words was following a procedure from Tomoji Tabata's uh, in East Dickens corpus. It just made it slightly neater as a researcher. Uh, I, I did not break the text into segments or chapters at first. I kept them all whole. So uh, my corpus, usually they're very small. The largest one is 31, the smallest is seven. So that's very small. Uh, but then what I wanted to do when I desired to look internally to see are these stylistic differences within the text as well as just between these 31 texts was I broke them into chapters but then I kept the components the same. So in principle component analysis, uh, when all of the texts are plotted along a new component, uh, it's telling you something about the variance within the words. I wanted to see how these texts were operating. Uh, this is difficult to explain. I'm trying to keep my language simple, but it was trying to look internally into the text. So I broke it into chapters, not segments. And what I would do is I'd plot them along the same variants, uh, the same components, but to do this I had to manually calculate new PC scores for these and uh, using this, uh, this formula here. It was very simple, I just went and counted the same words again, took the proportional frequencies and times it to the uh, PC, the loading that had been, the weight that had been given for the word, the corresponding word, and then I just took the sum of all that for each chapter and then it was plotted along the same graph as before. So then you can have a measure that is both the variance within the text and then where the chapters of those texts belong in relation to the variance of those texts. It might make more sense in a moment when I actually show some results. But that was the method. I did only use the proportional frequencies because all of my texts are of different sizes and all of the chapters that I used are of different sizes. And I made sure I used the correlation matrix every time I did my PCAs and I used R, the program R, in order to do all of my calculations. Except for this one, I actually used Microsoft Excel to do this because Microsoft Excel is good for some things. Okay, so with all that out of the way, I'm sorry about that, but I wanted to really outline some of these terms because I've been thinking long and hard about style and I want to know what people think at the end, particularly about the function of art because that's still something I'm not sure I have settled on where I stand on that. But on to some case studies. Okay, this was my first case study. I wanted to explore the genealogy of genres, which is an impossible question to answer and to even ask. And 
even if you could uh, theorize that stylometry could in some way pinpoint the exact arrival of science fiction or the exact arrival of fantasy, I'm not sure that you should. There are some very compelling arguments uh, around literary history about why uh, genres don't necessarily have start dates. Anyway, I wanted to look at the context uh, of these two genres, the early genres, and to do so, I just wanted to contextualise them. So I've taken 31 novels, all from the late Victorian period. I think the earliest one was 1875 and the latest one was 1900. And I wanted to focus in on just two of the works that are in this corpus. The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, which appears just here, and George MacDonald's Lilith, which appears just here. I chose these two texts because they're actually published in the same year, 1895. They're also exploring similar themes to the point where the authors were in correspondence with each other about how they were going to solve their particular representational problems. The thing they shared was the idea of transporting to a different dimension. For George MacDonald, this was to the spirit world, and for H.G. Wells, this was travelling through time. They came to very different solutions. Wells was quite admire, ad, admired MacDonald's neat solution, he called it, of a mirror. Wells obviously invented a machine to do his work. MacDonald went for the magic route, and you could almost say this represents the difference between science fiction and fantasy right there, just in these two texts. So it's a, to me, it was a very neat period of the of history of these two genres to study. Um, all 31 texts are by different authors, hopefully to cancel out any kind of authorial differences in the corpus. The corpus was provided to me by Professor Hugh Craig, so I didn't actually hand select any texts. Lilith and the Time Machine were even already in it, so it was kind of convenient for me, but then um, I was thinking about using some Morris works as fantasy instead, but MacDonald really fits well into this because of that relationship with Wells. So of the 99 words studied, actually I should mention first, I was very surprised by this result because we have Wells over here where there are some other adventure fictions like Haggard's King Solomon's Mines and this Joseph Conrad down here is a sea novel. So they're both very adventure based. Wells, like early science fiction is often talked about as being uh, packaged as adventure fiction, particularly the pulp tradition follow, just following Wells. And I thought George MacDonald's Lilith would stand out more, but it doesn't stand out at all. It's, it's in the middle, and uh, it's not on either extreme of that horizontal axis, which is the first principal component. And it confused me slightly because as a contemporary reader, when you read Lilith, it is a strange book with strange language. And uh, yet on these measures, with just these 99 words, it wasn't strange. What was strange at the top there are two utopian narratives. This is uh, Bulwer Lutton's The Coming Race and Samuel Butler's Erewhon, which is also considered a satire novel. But both are treated as utopian fictions and even read alongside The Time Machine, which again, some critics also read as a 19th century utopian narrative. So, I, oh, I should mention, I had a little test. There is no chronological uh, pattern along either of these axes. So, uh, it's not a matter of the PCA has distinguished between texts that were written earlier in the period I was studying or later. There is no chronological difference. When we turn to the words that made up that difference, we find that on the left-hand side are mostly our prepositions of, in, on, and from. The is furthest along to the left, but so is the article at. <coughs> so both indefinite and definite articles are on that left-hand side. This kind of makes sense. This is where all the adventure fiction belongs because these two graphs are uh, derived from each other, so they could be overlaid 
So all of these words appear relatively more in these adventure novels than they do in the novels on the right-hand side. The novels on the right-hand side are all domestic realist novels. That's the best category I've found to put them in. They vary to different extents in <coughs> what their subject matter is. But there's a lot of words at that end uh, that are modal verbs and other words, uh, words for negation such as not, and a lot of main verbs as well, be and have, conjunction but. There's also words, just when I went digging, I found that the words on that right hand side were found in the narration and in the dialogue. Because at first I thought maybe there's more dialogue in these and adventure, but it's found <coughs> in both. However, this was interesting later on. I decided to unpack Lilith because this was my most surprising result. So I went to the chapters of Lilith and this is where I did my first manual PCA score. So I have put, it's kind of hard to see on this, but I've put wells in the text that was found furthest to the right on here to give some kind of context for this. Lilith, it does actually spread. It doesn't clump together. And it has spreads more than either of these other texts I've included. This is the Time Machine in Green. Oh, sorry. It's touch? Yes. Yes. Ah! yes just got open. <laughs> this is great. I won't touch it again. Um, this, I was quite surprised because there is a pattern here to Lilith. It's not actually just sitting in the middle of the grass doing nothing. There's actually something happening here. There are, I can say, two different styles in Lilith. Because all of the chapters on the left, all of those on the left-hand side of the axis there, have no dialogue. I think between them, I counted about four lines of dialogue. And the chapters furthest to the right are pretty much all dialogue. These are the chapters where the narrator is having things explained to him. There's a lot of conversation happening. There's a lot of very archaic language as well. There's a lot of the modal verbs and the negation, not as they try to understand each other and ask questions of each other, as the narrator really tries to understand the world he's in. Whereas all of these chapters on the left are basically the narrator traveling across the land, using all of the prepositions that were found at that left-hand side. So even though Lilith sat in the middle of the original graph I showed you, within the actual text itself, there is a variation to the style. This was quite surprising to me because I was always told that when you've got your PCAs, pretty much the things in the middle you can just discard. You only really want to look at what's happening on either end because that's what it's weighted most heavily, on either the positive or the negative end of your axis. And even though Lilith may not have contributed much to the extremes that were found by a PC PC1, when plotted along the same component, it is actually having these chapters cluster according to the function of the chapter. If it's movement, it's up this end, and if it's dialogue, it's down the right-hand side. The next uh, exploration I did on this corpus was to look more closely at the time machine. This was where I was really interested because it clearly clustered with some other adventure novels. So I've included here the chapter titles. More it's, it's easier to see because the time machine is a much shorter book. What I was most interested in is whether or not there is a difference in style between the framing narrative and actual narrative. Because the time machine is told in what's called a club story. It's introduced by a narrator who we never know his name. And he it's, it, it's introduced in this world in a very domestic setting. And then the time traveler himself takes over and tells the story. The chapters of the frame narrative, chapters 1, 2, and 12, are lower. But it's particularly the two that are most directly framing the, the time traveler's tale that are the two clustered right down here at the bottom. And the very end is here at the top, the epilogue which even though it's told by the frame narrator, has a very different style, which I'll explain in just a minute. And here is chapter four, which is the first time the time traveler himself 
tells us what he thinks is happening in the future world. These actually, I believe, are clustered, like differentiated here on PC2 because of the difference in style between the utopian narratives, which appear at the top of the graph when it's all, all 31 texts, and the bottom, which is where the, the adventure narratives cluster on that y-axis. If we go back to the words on PC2, those that are weight, weighted lowest, we have some of our prepositions, and those that are weighted highest are, I don't know, it's a, it's a mixture of words, but I was able to find that particularly in <coughs> utopian narratives, which is what sits highest at the top of our y-axis, there's a lot of this kind of language I will say nothing of my ancestors, nor of the circumstances which led me to leave my native country. <clears throat> I thought I could better my fortunes more rapidly than in England, more perfect than the present, far more so than mankind. There's a lot of this comparing between his time and the utopian narrative that's been discovered. We see this in Erewhon, we see this in The Coming Race, and we see this in... Chapter 4 of The Time Machine. This is where the time <coughs> traveller himself is telling us all of the things he thinks about the future world and how they got there based on his own age. He talks about the social effort in which we are at present engaged, which is rated is uh, the word appearing at the highest point of PC2, and in fact, appears more frequently in the utopian narratives than any other narrative there. So PCA was successful in distinguishing between quite a distinct style of the late Victorian corpus, but it wasn't science fiction necessarily, and it definitely wasn't fantasy. It was more the utopian narrative. Now, scholars before me, have, without the aid of computers, have said that the utopian narratives of this particular era were pretty unique for utopian narratives in general. And actually that as soon as the turn of the century came, the whole style of the utopian narrative changed. And that was when Wells started writing utopian narratives. So it's interesting to me that here we have the utopian style actually being more distinct from the rest of the corpus along that PC2 measure. And yet, Wells's style goes up there when it's talking about the future and talking about the particularly the relationship between his world and the future. And the epilogue is up there because the epilogue is when the frame narrative says, will he return? I don't know. I've got a lot of detail here that I'm going to skip because I've got some more graphs to show you. This is my second case study, which was looking at Olaf, William, William Olaf Stapledon. He was a British writer, and actually, has anybody heard of Olaf Stapledon? No, okay. He was a British writer who was writing between World War I and World War II, but his first career was as a philosopher. He uh, failed being a philosopher, unfortunately. Um, or so his biographers will tell you. Uh, and he wrote occasionally to Wells. They had lunch a few times. He was very interested in this type of fiction. But he actually has been called the second generation science fiction writer. And people even consider him to be the second forefather of science fiction, the first being H.G. Wells. And yet, no one knows about him. <laughs> in fact, even among science fiction scholars, hardly anyone knows about him. And there is a really, really good reason why. His books are terrible. They're really bad. But his ideas are amazing. His ideas are incredible. Arthur C. Clarke would, tell, would have told you that. Isaac Asimov loved his work. Robert Heinlein wrote his work. All of these authors celebrated Stapledon's ideas. And yet, in an inter they, uh, his works went out of print for a long time after World War II, paper shortages and things like that. I think the British just say that to save face. But paper shortages, when they were finally brought back into print, there was an introduction written by a scholar called Basil Davenport. And at the very end of his introduction to this 
first reprint of three of Olaf Stapleton's work, he said, Stapleton was not a great poet. In fact, he was not even a very good novelist. But his ideas are important. Even then, people are selling us. His, his, his work is not good. His style in particular is not good. And yet, he has this quality that I mentioned is very important to literary style. His style is idiosyncratic to the point where Frederick Jameson has said that it is so idiosyncratic that it's unclassifiable. To some it's repulsive and while to others it's fascinating. I found only one scholar from the 21st century who has even considered that maybe Stapleton was influenced more by the modernists who were very experimental with their style than by the science fiction pulp tradition which was also at the same time uh, coming of age in America. So, he's one of the most original practitioners in early science fiction. That's what's said about all our staples in these days because of all of his experiments. And yet, no one has ever studied his style. I thought it deserved some closer attention, so I've compared it, as you can see, to H.G. Wells. I wanted to know, is it really so idiosyncratic that it would be completely split by the PCA? And it's not actually completely split, according to authorial signal, at least. I'm going to try not to touch this. But you can see here, this is a cluster of Olaf Stapleton, the OS. And here is some more Olaf Stapleton. And here is a H.G. Wells. And here is a H.G. Wells. And then everything on that side is H.G. Wells. The interesting thing to me is this work here. And this was really fascinating that H.G. Wells came over here. But also, this is fairly tightly clustered compared to the rest of Stapleton's work. There is a really simple explanation for this, and it comes down to the classification of subgenres within Stapleton's corpus. The four texts here on the left are all future history works. Basically, they are what Stapleton called myths in essay creation, and they explore the future of humanity as though it were a history. The way he would do this is he would pretend somehow that his protagonist had been transported into the future or that somebody from the future had come back and left a textbook that he'd found or that somebody had, uh, had a vision of the future and they wrote it down as though it was a textbook. The others of uh, Olaf Stapleton's works are not like this at all. They don't look at this broader picture, picture of history. They look closely at individuals. They have protagonists at their center. H.G. Wells's The Shape of Things to Come, which is that text right there, is also a future history work. And I've got the dates there. It was written three years after Stapleton first published his landmark future history work. So it hasn't really been said before, but I'm willing to claim that actually Olaf Stapleton influenced H.G. Wells rather than Stapleton being influenced by H.G. Wells. This is not something that has been said before, but I think it's fairly evident from uh, the PCA that Wells is coming closer to Stapleton's style when the rest of their works are quite split. This was an experiment for H.G. Wells and it didn't go well. Everybody who talks about his work say that everything he wrote from about well, you know, basically everything he wrote in the 20th century is just not as good as what he wrote in the older century. But the future history is particularly problematic because these are the works in particular of Stapleton's that are considered unreadable. So I wanted to explore if they're really unreadable, what is actually happening in them so consistently that all four of his future histories have clustered together. So he's consistently doing the same thing that everybody detests. These are the words that indicate the, the differences. And we have over here, which in by there, actually I put it in the table for this, there you go. These are the 10 highest uh, 
that were on that left hand side. By in there, more which even other only life own. So these works of future history have a concern with life. They also have a concern with really broad sweeping statements. I have a few examples using that first word there, by. Let it first buy the British, but later buy the North Americans. Oh, there's no more examples. I have a lot more examples in my thesis. There's a lot of uh, connections being made using this one preposition, which you can contrast to the highest word on the other side of the graph, which is where all of H.G. Wells' other works are, is up. And these, again, are related to the adventure pace, the fast-paced narrative of a lot of H.G. Wells' earlier fiction. For example, in The Invisible Man, he got up, he went up, he led the way up, he tried to struggle up, he stood up, threw up, given up. It's all adventure again down that end and connections of ideas down this end. But in order to cover vast periods of time, in fact, the future history is covered about 2 billion years of human history. So they did not go into a lot of detail. They had to use the third person plural, there. Their lives were brief, their love of life intense. The third men were very subject to a craving for personal immortality. This is the kind of description he would give of entire epochs of human history and then very quickly move on to describe the next epoch of human history. Or how he explains the features of an alien race. Though their faces were inhuman, the basic pattern of their minds was not unlike our own. Their senses were much like ours. These words also appear in Wells's future history, The Shape of Things to Come. He also refers to entire races through this third person plural there. He's also considering how they were judged by their contents and had a habit of, re of reaction to uh, how their brains might have worked and all of these things. He's, he's really discussing it globally. It's not the same kind of narrative he wrote before. These are... Uh, I want to go back to the idea of the utopian narrative again because the future histories are distinct but up here is, is Wells's utopian narrative and Olaf Stapleton's work called The Flames. So up the top is Wells's A Modern Utopia and the work up there with it is The Flames. Now The Flames was written as a letter so I was very surprised to find it with a modern utopia because a modern utopia is about this big and the flames is about this big and they have very different subject material. But the words which are situated highest up there are things like will and be. It's the closest thing the English language has to future tense and it's used throughout both of these narratives. So although it marks the utopian narrative as distinct, this future tense, it also marks the flames as distinct, even though it was not at all a utopian narrative or attempting to predict a future society. What I'm trying to say in drawing this distinction is that even though I can fairly confidently say that, H, uh, that Olaf Stapleton has two genres working within his corpus of science fiction, this one that is protagonist-based and a more adventure-based, and this future history one, which also influenced H.G. Wells. There are some things explained by the PCA in the style that does not relate so easily to the content, to this idea that actually there are subgenres being identified here. Sometimes it seems that the style is um, distinct, distinguishing it even when I can't quite make sense of how they're related in any other way other than how the PCA says they're related. This actually comes up in my very next case study because what I wanted to do was to see whether or not Stapleton actually was also distinct from a modernist. So I considered his work with uh, Virginia Woolf's work. I really should have made all of these labels bigger. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is nine of Virginia Woolf's novels with nine of Stapleton's novels. Nine is the maximum number of Stapleton wrote of uh, 
science fiction novels. And again, these are the future histories. And this is the flames. Again, the one that was with I touch it. The flames, the one that was with modern utopia. This is the waves by Virginia Woolf. This is the fiction of, Sir of uh, Stapletons that have uh, a, f a human or at least a superhuman or sometimes even a super dog as a character. Uh, and these are the rest of uh, Virginia Woolf's works up here. The one closest on PC1 to Wells is Orlando, which is probably her most fantastic work, you could say. And Sirius here is Stapleton's attempt at a biography. So it was interesting to me that maybe the thing that is drawn, drawing them together is their solution to presenting the lives of their characters as a pseudo biography has a similar style. However, the texts that are furthest apart, this is the star maker, and this is the years. Both of these texts were an attempt to explore the cosmos, and in particular to expand the vision of, of the stars through their literature. And Wolf and Sableton wrote to each other about this desire to write this style of fiction. Wolf congratulated Stapleton on his ability to grasp ideas that she herself, in a quote, tried to express much more fumblingly in fiction. And in turn, Stapleton wrote to Wolf praising her artistry and claiming that he would never be a storyteller like her. The works of Wolf and Stapleton are separated here. But I explored in more detail, and I'll, I'll spare you the details today, but I did explore in more detail this idea that the biographies, the fictional biographies, share a style. Yet at the same time, I pointed out extensively in my thesis that the artistry is not the same. Stapleton falls into all of these traps of showing, of telling instead of showing. He very rarely gives us any poetry within his uh, fictional prose. He just sticks to the scientific narration, and Sirius is the narration of a dog that has been augmented and has almost uh, human-like capabilities of speech. It's also a book that uh, has been claimed to be Stapleton's most aesthetically pleasing, and yet even when I really closely looked at it, I could only find a few passages that I thought were aesthetically pleasing. But it's, it's great to see that it's actually the closest to, to Virginia Woolf's. The thing about the Star Maker and the years that I found really interesting was that when Virginia Woolf first started talking about writing the years, she recorded in her diary that she thought she might write an essay novel, a hybrid that is both essay and novel. And in the introduction to The Star Maker, in his own preface, Stapleton wrote, this is a work that is not a work of fiction, it is an essay in myth creation. So even though they maybe shared this solution to their representational problems at first, it very quickly turned out that Wolf dismissed the idea of an essay, cut every essay bit from the years, and published it separately as a different volume. And then what remained was the most stylistically distinct book from all of Staple, from Stapleton's equivalent essay in myth creation, The Star Maker. And when I looked at the styles, again, what happens is this down here on the right-hand side were all words relating to socialising and a domestic life. There's quite a few prepositions as they move about the house and things like this. But most of it has these uh, pronouns that are necessary in order to have dialogue and conversation. Whereas the star maker, again, has pronouns that are uh, explaining whole epochs of society there. Down the bottom is the waves. And I know that I only just uh, I'll have read your chapter in one of the handbooks where it discusses the waves in a bit more detail. But there's another computationalist uh, linguistics approach that has discussed the waves because it's in monologues and lots of soliloquies, and they've been found to be quite stylistically distinct. The flames, I don't think, is quite as 
experimental as, as um, I, the flames is not as experimental as the waves. And I, I don't want to say it was at all modeled on the waves, but it is a letter and it is written in that first person, which I think is why it's down here, because those are the words that were down there distinguished with the waves. The thing about the flames is that it's also been called Stapleton's most ambitious work. So there's something here about his experiments always falling with uh, a modern utopia, which was Wells's experiment, and the waves, which was one of Virginia Woolf's, um, not outlandish, but you know, major experiments in her fiction. Again, there's no other real correlation between the two texts. Um, I think I'm going to move straight on to my third case study. But I got really excited by this study because Olaf Stapleton has uh, never had his language studied before. <laughs> in fact, as I said in the introduction, everybody abhors it and most students say they try to read it and they can't get through even Star Maker or Sirius. Uh, and yet it's been really interesting to me to find that maybe he was not so much a science fiction writer as a modernist. And when people try to read him as a science fiction writer, they're expecting that like what was packaged in the time machine, an adventure narrative and with ideas that challenge them, sure, but that they can read and grasp with. And maybe if we just change the way we think about him, he might be a little bit more readable. I'm not sure. That's that's something I'm gonna have to have to actually look into later on. Uh, here's my third case study. This was my most exciting one because this was on Harry Potter. Everything else up until this point are works that are in the public domain. Even Stapleton, who was writing in the 30s, is in public domain. But this is Harry Potter. And uh, if you want to work with Harry Potter, uh, you can, or at least you could when I was doing my research, purchase the ebooks from the Pottermore site without any digital uh, security on them because they're made available so that people can, intentionally so that people can change the format of these books and transfer them from computer to Kindle and whatever other device you read on, uh, which in Australia is something that makes this kind of computer work uh, legal under copyright. So I wanted to explore whether or not there are actually stylistic changes within Harry Potter, because it's widely acknowledged that from the first book to the seventh book, the series changes. We know this happens. You line them up on a shelf, and you can clearly see that the fourth book is literally three times the size of the third book, which means it's all three, first three in one. It also changes in its reading age if you study it, so the like the literacy level changes, it like kind of goes up in grade levels. The other thing that changes is the maturing of the themes. It's often being discussed that Harry Potter goes from being children's literature to being young adults' literature, because the protagonists age one year in each book. And I'm saying things you already know, but I wanted to know if it actually does change in terms of its style. And again, these are only 100 words that I counted. I then discarded all of the names, so actually it was 92 words that, we, that remained. And I found a pretty good finding here. It does seem to change. The first book is on the left, the sixth book is on the far right. It's not purely chronological. There is. Uh, the sixth and the seventh were reversed, so is the third and the second. But I did a little, uh, looked at the uh, correlation coefficient and found that it was statistically significant that the order of the books along PC1 and the order of chronology. Still, maybe a little bit flimsy and light on because these are only seven books here. So again, it's, this is the smallest corpus I was working with. But I wanted to know, what are, what are the words happening? What's actually changing within these books? Again, down the left-hand side, there's a lot of prepositions. And then on the right-hand side, there are modal verbs and negation. Not, it's, it's actually very similar to the findings I found in all my other corpus so far. The adventure is down this end, and the dialogue is up the other end. So I, was, I did a little bit of digging and we can really show how actually in both the first and the sixth book, which are considered most distinct, both styles are happening at once. So there's still adventure in the later books and it's still in a very similar style. And uh, you can see this when I broke it into chapters. So all of the cool colors are 
Yeah, that's right. Cool colours are the early books. No, the late books. And all the warm colours are the early books. Yeah. So all the yellows and oranges are the early books, the first three. The grey is the fourth book because it's kind of always considered a bit in the middle. It's the first one to really change, but it's mostly in the middle. And these are all the later books. So there are some chapters of the later books that appear closer to this side, like this one and this one. These are all chapters that have heavy action. These are chapters where they're running from things. These are chapters where people are being, like, having their, you know, being shot at is the wrong terminology for Harry Potter. <laughs> this is, these are the action ones. And all of these chapters here, and the chapters from books one, two, and three, that are furthest to the right hand side, these chapters, these are all the chapters where Dumbledore sits down with Harry and explains to him the significance of everything that's happened up until this point in the series and the books. So the style, even in the first books, is on, when it goes towards the right-hand side, this is because of Dumbledore and his dialect. He uses that, not, would, could, more than any other character. Well, I actually haven't done the maths on that, so I can't say that, but I suspect he uses it more than any other character. The other thing is that his dialogue is much more formal than any of the other characters, even the other adults. And so did and not appear down this end, whereas the contract contracted forms um, appear elsewhere. And when I had a little look at it, I could only find one instance other than in the first, very first book, where Dumbledore would ever use a contraction instead of the uncontracted form. And this one example was... Uh, if you know the books, it was in the sixth book, right before he died, and he was taking some poison and he was being tortured. This is the only time he lapsed into anything other than what is a very formal kind of vernacular. So we can say that the books change according to formality. We can say the books change because there's more explanations that happen in the later books than in the first books because they get more complicated. We can say that the books change because there becomes less action and more explanation. I don't actually think that that last one is true. I think this kind of shows that there are some extremes, these chapters, which I think really pull the rest of it along. And the sixth book has a whole lot of explanations because it's the last book where Dumbledore is alive. I just realised there are spoilers in this. But you should all know by now the story of Harry Potter if you're interested in ever knowing it. Um, I think there is still a lot of uh, action happening. And in fact, I think she actually has a fairly stable style that happens across her books. Because when I went to look at some of these words, I would find in particular scenes of action, similar collocations of words. She has particular things that she likes to use and say. A lot of adverbs, as has been pointed out by some people. And these remain consistent throughout the books. I think what's changing here is the necessity. She's required to explain more to readers who are ageing, as well as to a protagonist who she's focalising through, who's also ageing. I wanted to explore it a bit further, particularly because everything about the chapters to the right seem to be because Dumbledore is speaking more. Could it just be because of dialogue that these books seem to be different, the later books seem to be different. So I broke it into direct speech and the rest of narration. This is a whopping 74.6% variance explained by the first component, which is the highest in my entire corpus. I think everything else was 17% as highest. But all of the direct speech is on this side and all of the narration is on this side. And then, according to the second component, which is the y-axis, it goes from first to six, and this one goes from first to seven. It's, it's absolutely correlated here that there is change happening in Harry Potter in both the direct speech and the rest of the narration. It can't just be because Dumbledore has to explain more that the books are changing. So I wanted to understand what's actually changing here. This is probably the oddest word loading graph I've, I've ever seen. And I think that's partly because of this huge amount of variance. 
But we have over here for the narration in particular, I was interested because I kind of already knew that all of this would happen with the with Dumbledore's speech changing. But we have the fe the female pronouns up there, she and her. And when I had a little look, they do steadily increase. The rate at which uh, the female pronouns increases as the books go on. There's also the word wand. They use their wands more in the later books. Maybe that's because they're becoming proficient wizards. And in the early books, they're not allowed to use their wands outside of school. And in the last book, they are. There's again some, pre some prepositions down here. And they, it increasingly becomes individualized. So it starts out as Harry and his group, and they're often in the group, so there's often that uh, they went over here and things like this. And then it becomes more internalized, and it becomes more about Harry later on, and particularly because in around the fourth and fifth book, he's an adolescent teenager who's very self-absorbed. And then it later becomes about actually saving people. And Hermione has a much bigger role in the later books in helping them actually succeed. I wasn't quite content with my results because I wanted to know if there was change in other series. So I got permission to use the Chronicles of Narnia and I wanted to know is there change that happens in Narnia as well. It's, it's a similar kind of idea written a lot earlier but uh, it's for children. The difference is that the children don't age, and when they do age, they actually are excluded from Narnia, and so it changes the protagonist. There is no change here that is chronological. There's no change here that is from the order of publication. It's just because Caspian is a book that is about adventure, and there's a lot of dialogue, and The Magician's Nephew is a book that sets up everything for the world and spends a lot of time discussing how Narnia came to be. The only real difference is that the line that was in the wardrobe along this second component is the most distinct. And it was published first, so then you could say that there's a chronological variation in Narnia in that the first is more distinct than all the rest. But there's nothing like the progressive chronological change that we can see in, in Harry Potter. I got one more series just to test. This is Young Wizards by Diane Duane. And if you haven't heard of Olaf Stapleton, then there's no way you've heard of Diane Duran. <laughs> but uh, because she is still writing, this series started before Harry Potter, and it's still going. She has plans to publish at least another couple of books. Uh, she also writes for Star Trek and Star Wars and some of these uh, book columns. And I have not found a, a single scholarly article on any of her work. But this is a book that is, book series that is pretty much Harry Potter, written before Harry Potter. It's tracking the change and progress of young wizards learning how to be wizards. And here again we can see there's some chronological change in that the first four books are over here and the rest are over here. But there's a big gap. Like where Harry Potter was kind of more tracking along the x-axis, there's actually a gap here. She took an eight-year gap between writing the fourth book and the fifth book. And in that time, she went and wrote other things. So I have this theory that in that time, her style changed. It just changed. All her styles change. She did an updated edition as well. This is the updated edition she did because she realized that because she started writing in the 80s, uh, they had no mobile phones, and kids these days need to read about wizards who have mobile phones. So she updated it, and yet structurally nothing has changed, because using the 100 words, nothing has changed. So she didn't actually update anything. So this is an interesting case study, actually, that I explored in my thesis about how PCA tends to work even when you do make minor changes, because she also changed some chronological issues in her series, where she'd... Uh, ironed out a few other things, and yet there's no substantial changes between this one and this one. So anyway, at the end of my uh, three different case studies, I've studied over a hundred years of science fiction and fantasy using very small corpuses, so it's not at all big data. But it's been really interesting to look at the way that 
studying language of these two genres can actually reveal new things that I didn't know about the genres, such as strategies that the authors used. There are quite a lot of really interesting things about the relationship between Wells and the adventure fiction that I teased out in my thesis. Things that people often, particularly in science fiction and fantasy, haven't really gone into much depth, almost because they're a little embarrassed that science fiction somehow resembles adventure fiction. And so I really admire the way that stylometry tends to get away from all of this kind of politics about whether or not we can study the style of something that is or isn't considered art or literature and actually just allows us to explore some really important, what I consider to be important things. So, yeah, I'm sorry that's been a little ad hoc. This is something I've been working on for a long time and have found it difficult to squeeze it into 45 minutes. But hopefully there's something here that has sparked some questions that I'm more than happy to answer or comments that you'd like to make about the work. Yeah. So thank you, Naomi, for this beautiful lecture. And as she asked you, you can now ask some questions. If, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you saw that the dots of two initial perspective moments, right? Yes. And before you draw our attention to the numbers, to the axis, I should pay attention to the yeah. What fraction of uh, the total variance do your first two components explain? Yeah, that's that's really a good question. So ultimately your the PCA will return, in my case, it always returns the same number of components of the smallest dimension in my data set. So if there were seven books, it only returned seven components. And when there were 31 books, it returned 31 components. And when you add it all together, the 31 components would equal 100, and the seven would equal 100. Yes. So normally, PC1 and PC2 together would come close to representing about 50% of the variance. In my first case study, I think it was under 50, it was 40%. And uh, in these last ones, it was uh, accounting for a lot more. I presume only because the corpora was smaller. Yeah. No worries. I might throw a question out to the experts in the room, actually, on that point. Because something my supervisor told me was that you should always have the same number of components returned as variables. So if you've got 100 words, it will return 100 components, but I always found that it returned whatever was smallest. So when the studies that I did where I wanted to look at, I've looked at some other studies where I've had maybe 300 or 400 text samples and 100 words, it's returned 100 components. So it's always returned the smallest, whatever is the smallest dimension in my data. The and I'm not sure why. Sorry? Okay. Okay, so it's because of the number of dimensions. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Other people have told me it's just because of using R and they maybe got different methods using something else, but no, it's actually the matrix. Good. So if I may, um, it's not, it is a question, a question I have no answer to. Uh, say, how do you think we can, we can infer um, or say anything about the style of stylistic using just the frequencies of Portions of one of the mm. most frequent words. So mm. I have no answer to that. Yeah. So I just do it without asking that. I am. You're, you're probably really familiar with the Stanford Literary Lab title, which is Style at the Scale of a Sentence, their pamphlet. Uh, they pose a really interesting um, to complicate it further, because, yeah, this is not an answer, this is just a comment, further comment that uh, they had two camps within the Stanford Literary Lab. and. Um, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but both of them had some really powerful logic uh, explaining their different stances, because some of them thought it had to happen at the scale of the sentence or higher, and others thought that if you can't see it in the word frequencies because of the way sentences are structured, then 
then it can't exist at all almost. But I, yeah, I don't really have any other answers to that other than I uh, often return to that particular pamphlet to, <laughs> to again read both sides to, I'm not sure where I sit on this. Because the only thing I can say is that um, I've always been very surprised at what word frequencies tell us. And um, it may not be an inference about style that you can draw in the way that other people like to define style or, or understand this thing. But mm, I'm, there's a really brilliant quote. This is a bit glib in, in the context of how serious I think this question is from my field. But Ursula Le Guin has said that fantasy writers need to pay very close attention to uh, their language because when they're creating something in a world that has previously never existed, because a lot of fantasy worlds don't exist in this world, they're, they're creating it for the first time. Therefore, they're the first speakers to ever say anything in this world. And she says, she finishes this brilliant essay on language by saying, every word counts. And I feel that if every word counts as you're creating it, then you can count every word to look at what's happening within these texts. But that's quite a little glib <laughs> response. I may have like to follow up on Mercy's question. And again, it's not totally for this again, as Mercy said, I do that too. But I, I think we still have a little gap in our reasoning between the results we get. Mm -hmm. They can say a lot of things. Uh, and a pretty good example for, for one of your cases later on. And uh, and then we say, and that happens because, okay, in Harry Potter it seems it's, it's easy. It's, they're growing up, the girl is becoming more of a girl rather than one of the guys, etc. Obviously the perspective changes, etc. But and then we go, so then we get our results, and then we say, aha, that's because the that what the, the words that constitute that one component, they come into all those contexts that that fit our hypothesis. But do we have a, do we have quantitative evidence that that is that, that is what's happening? Mm -hmm. I mean, because that's that's again my problem again. So uh, mm -hmm. have you considered this? Uh, Yes, I have considered this, and in particular, I've been concerned on the lack of um, literature, like theorizing around this topic. I've actually um, found that there's a gap there as well. Like we just don't tend to to talk about it. Like the discipline as a whole maybe doesn't really talk about it, and I haven't found many. I pro probably the closest to this idea of a gap in interpret like between signal and interpretation has probably come from Stanley Fish, but it's from start from just purely stylistics, not the computational stuff. But I I have spent a bit of time doing a lot of experiments, which I didn't outline today, and in fact I actually didn't really outline very much in my thesis, only slightly where I've gone and I've done it on lots of different levels. So I've done it on 30 frequent words and 50 frequent words and 100 and 150 and 300. And something that uh, John Burroughs said to me really early is that the beautiful thing about PCA is that it will tell you the words that are affiniated and disaffiniated and the way that these texts interact with each other. And then we can draw inferences from these and then we can go and test them. And when I first quoted him on that, I left the going and testing it bit out. Um, that was in one of my first ever conferences because I hadn't gone and done any of this testing the inferences. Uh, and he said that to me fairly recently in an email actually. But he, I really see that in his career, the way that he's then gone on and found lots of other different quantitative methods for testing these things and these hypotheses that he has. And uh, so that's something that as a literary scholar, I don't think I've been probably trained or equipped to do, but which is important work and which is happening here, I believe, with focusing on methodology. I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but these are the things that no, I've been really thinking question. about. That but was, like, quite the help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may hold on to uh, speaking, mm. uh, could you show us the um, 
first the the uh, the one from Virginia Woolf. Yeah, that's the one. So because when I do Virginia Woolf, she's she's used all over the place. Mm. And again, with no uh, good evidence whatsoever, I, I like to associate that with the fact that that the end each of her books was a separate uh, attempt to ask at self curing herself. Mm. She probably was a very different person. Now, what we see here from York, you, you mentioned uh, Orlando, which is well, pretty fantastic and strange, but the next thing that comes pretty close is night and day, mm. and that is the, that, that's what the Polish translator of that book called the, uh, an old, a boring old-fashioned uh, love story, very much Victorian mm. and not experimental at all. Mm. Mm. And, and and then and then what, and then with the picture that we have of of Stapleton is that he's all over the place and and Virginia Woolf seems like a paragon of of unity. Mm. Was he like? You know, I think well, he was a failed philosopher. So, <laughs> and the first book he tried to write that was not philosophy was a book of poems. And then he very quickly moved on to writing science fiction because all else failed, it seems. Uh, okay. That's not really an answer. My more serious answer would be that uh, he, he was self-confessed not a very good storyteller. And I think he was really trying to acquire a craft. And I think he probably experimented a great deal just in trying to actually articulate his ideas. But yeah, in but terms of his... You so many other bad authors. Like yeah. Rowling. Yeah. <laughs> My thesis was made up of, of bad authors, yeah. It's, it's, it was perhaps striking that um, Virginia Woolf is you're right, is close together. And I did do a little test on the standard deviation and her texts are not spread as much over either of the components where Stapleton's are. So mathematically you can say that, yeah, there's a greater spread there. I'm interested this year as a student of mine wrote the, her thesis on uh, science fiction and fantasy, both in English and translated into Polish from Russian and English and also Polish. Uh, so it was a lot of stuff. Now, her English corpus was 250 novels. That's because we don't look what's legal, we take what we want. Right. And, uh, and, and, she, and her cluster analysis started showing a pretty good division in the genre in, in the English corpus at about a, a thousand, a thousand words, years. and anything before that was, was pretty good. Yeah. So it's probably a lot of those rare words and yeah. So yeah. if you want to expand stuff, that corpus is yeah is still available if you're interested. Yeah, I would be interested. It's not kosher, but it's available. I wanted to say a brief word on copyright, actually. I, I, yes, please. Um, because I I did a bit of research into this uh, a great deal in my first couple of years, because I even went and got some uh, some advice of lawyers. So the University of Newcastle. The, the lawyers they pay to advise their researchers pretty much say, oh, if we're not sure, therefore don't do it. <laughs> Anything they're not sure about is don't do. The actual researchers in the law school, however, had a, had a slightly different story to say. And what I learned was that in Australia, when you uh, say you legally purchase it for the right of using for your research, as you would if you were just reading it for an actual copy or your library has a copy, to do what we do, we then have to break the security encryption. So the only law you're breaking is the statute that you entered into, which was the statutory agreement, sorry, that you entered into. So it's the tort, the contract. When you purchase the ebook, you're agreeing with the publisher that you won't break the encryption. It's in there, it's in the fine uh, written word. I went and checked with all of them. They all have it. <laughs> I checked. Even Google Books has it. You can't break the 
Google Books is slightly more vague, so maybe you could and get away with it, but maybe you don't want to cross Google. I don't know. Sorry? You may you may not want to cross Google. That's a very frequent word though. Yes, I'm not saying. Usually comes the one hundred. The one hundred, yeah. Can I think as well. I found that if you can buy the books without the security encryption, you're not breaking the copyright law of Australia because it's within fair use for academic purposes. Australia is good because uh, Virginia Woolf was the uh, lead was in the public domain five years before. It's, it's good, but this is also very confusing. So for any, any writer that has passed away before 1955, you only have to wait 50 years after their death. And for every writer who oh, has passed away 50, after 55, you have to now wait the 70 years. So they changed the law to be in keeping with the US and, and everywhere else, but they didn't apply it retrospectively, so it's from that 55 mark when they changed the law. <laughs> yeah. But So what I'm trying to say, like, I, I really think there's, there is copyright protections for academics doing academic work on books that would otherwise maybe be an infringement because there's obviously very little commercial gain for doing anything in this sphere and that's really what the copyright is protecting against. So if you can get it DRM free, I'd say you can claim that it's within copyright. All of the texts I used, the Diane Duan, the Young Wizards one, was, co was uh, without copyright, co the security encryption and so was Harry Potter. But the Narnia, I actually had to write to the estate, and surprisingly, they wrote back saying they gave me permission to break the security encryption. I wrote to, I wrote to a lot of uh, book companies, and I just, my first two years of my PhD, I literally almost every week would send out a, a couple of emails to different uh, estates and different. C.S. Lewis's estate was the only estate that ever got back to me, so. Yeah, but science fiction is leading the way in DRM-free publishing because they're all anti-capitalists who write science fiction and, well, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so you can find a lot of this kind of underground self-publishing happening, really good science fiction fantasy writers who are even winning the big awards and they're all DRM-free, so there's room to expand the corpus legally. Anyway, so that's my little note about copyright. If you can find it DRM-free, I think you could go. That's the Australian perspective. Check with your university lawyers. Could you just, <clears throat> just buy a paper version of the book and type it all on your computer and use a sphere if you want to yes. scale it. Yes, so you can if do you, that. If you actually break and copy it and pretend to use it as a <laughs> type by you, you're yeah. limited. Maybe if you then present a 1,000 Book strong corpus in only a year's <laughs> worth of work, maybe they won't believe you. But <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe this is. You are this not is, struck by lightning. Maybe, first maybe, two years of yeah. maybe this is something you can keep in mind when going for grants. You know, you get some extra hours for research assistants to do this work, but then actually put them to work doing something else and just. Just, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> or if more crimes. If I can compare the same to some technicalities, or actually, my question is related to, to the one Jan asked about uh, the girl and her different behavior on this, on this plane. I mean, the greatest novelty of your approach is definitely the fact that you produce something in the PCA, and then you freeze the loadings, and then you fill mm. it with some fresh data. That's great. That's absolutely mm. fantastic and we're going to use it in the future. But the question is, the physical components as well is hugely dependent on what you put to mm. produce this, say, canvas, right? Mm. And now, uh, did you play with your know, different uh, setups or different um, text put into the input into mm. this uh, PC mm. before you uh, did the second stage of you know, the film? Yeah, I did. I did. And this is where we can come back into the danger zone of uh, what inferences we can draw without uh, testing really carefully because uh, when you, for example, when you just take the 199 chapters that make up Harry Potter and do a PCA straight on those, 
uh, rather than manually calculating PC scores for those chapters based on PC scores of the seven books, you do get very different results, for sure. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I have that data somewhere because I did do that. I went to uh, a few different lengths. One of the bigger problems I found was the problem of interpretation. That initial interpretation is really difficult when you've got 199 different data points uh, on a PCA, each representing uh, a fair chunk of uh, a text because it all represents a chapter, which some are small and some are big. Uh, and I could not discern any uh, patterns of within the chapters themselves. Certainly within the words, you can start to piece together a, a picture of what may be distinguishing them. Uh, so, yeah, I think that was probably my, my major consideration, but it would deserve more exploration into what are the actual differences then happening and, and why you did this. But when I was first doing this, uh, I remember I came to Professor Craig with my chapter score, like the just a PCA done on the chapters. And he said to me, now you're changing everything. <laughs> this work, <laughs> let's go back to what you found in the books. And I was like, but I want to study the chat. I want to actually get deeper into the texts, which is the problem I was having just looking at them. And then that's where he came up. He actually came up with uh, that you could do this. And then I went off and experimented and found that you can. Anyway, yeah. So there's... I, I wish now that I'd been less of a literary scholar and more of a statistician to have, or a scientist to have really methodically recorded all of the different uh, experiments I did and then why I came to the, to the decision to, to keep some in it. And it's probably a line I should go down in the future. Uh, and I was bound a little bit by my, for some reason, maybe a logical drive to present a thesis that is literary criticism, not stylometry. So I've asked for it to be read by hopefully people who are <laughs> within science fiction and fantasy as well as stylometry. So in that sense, writing for two different audiences has, uh, has, proved, has proven difficult. I don't know if anyone else could, could give me any advice on this uh, later on because, uh, yeah, to find that line between only discussing methodology and <laughs> procedure and actually spending the majority of the time in the text. So I present more block quotes than I do graphs, which is something that other people have complained about digital humanities, that it reads graphs as though they're block texts, and I intentionally have more block quotes than graphs in my thesis. So in fact, I've shown you all the graphs in my thesis. This is all, this is all of them. Plus, there's, a, there's quite a few tables, but I didn't show you the tables. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that wasn't much of an answer. Do we have any more questions? Okay. If, if not, I have a little bonus extra for all of the language people, linguists. I have some Australian slang terms that you might like to uh, learn. A blowy is a blowfly. Uh, Dinky die. Now this one's not uh, used so much anymore by the next generation, but I'm really hoping it will come back because it means really, truly, honestly, and I feel like we need more of that in our world today. And I recently heard a grandma exclaim over my friend's engagement ring that it was a dinky die ring. So it still, it still exists. Hooroo, we say when we say goodbye, usually over the telephone, but in person too. Ripper, this is a very classic one. We've even rewritten some Christmas carols to include have a ripper Christmas. Um, servo is our word for petrol station because we actually call them service stations, so it's that classic Australian abbreviating with an O. And tall poppies is what we call all successful people. And our nation actually has a cultural paradigm called tall poppy syndrome. We always champion the underdog and we always cut down the tall poppies. Always. It's just, this is just our cultural code. So there you go, a little bit of Australian 
uh, slang. <laughs> we'll use all of that like, next time we need to. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> I was hoping that you would. Uh, I can do a little quiz later on if you yeah, like, yeah. just to help you. Uh, really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Particularly if you're visiting uh, Professor Craig in Australia, the blowy in particular will come out quite a bit because we have a lot of them. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, there you go. Okay. So, thank you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.